Memorial Day weekend, it is interesting if you look in any kind of a dictionary or encyclopedia today, part of the definition of the Memorial Day weekend now is called the beginning of summer and then the end comes at Labor Day. Now, I don't know about you, but that seems to be a rather inadequate definition of Memorial Day, just simply the beginning of what? Summer. And it kind of tells us something, doesn't it? Uh, In the world that we live in, it is easy sometimes to forget things that are important to us. Memorial Day for me, when I first remember it as a little child, usually started on Friday evening of that weekend. Like many people, our family would go camping or go to our cabin after church on Sabbath and have that extra day of being out there, which was always good. But on Friday evening, I remember we would get in the car as a family in Missoula, and we would drive over to the north side of the tracks, as they say in Missoula. And over there, there was an old lumber pulp-type mill, and right next to that was the Missoula Cemetery. And I would remember dad would drive us as a family on those narrow little roads that crisscross every which way through the cemetery and they have them listed by letters of the alphabet or whatever and would have no idea where we were going in that little plot of roads that crisscrossed. And in between all of those roads were green, beautiful grass patches that were filled with gravestones. And we would come to a place on the road where we would park, and as a family, we would follow mom and dad across that green grass, passing several of those gravestones along the way, and pretty soon we would come to one where we would stop. And the gravestone said Peggy Sue Jenkins, my little sister that I have never met. She died before I was born, four years old, of leukemia. And for a young boy who had never met her, for me it was a walk across that grass and looking at something I really knew nothing about. But I knew one thing, and that was that it was different for my parents, my sister, because when they looked at that stone, they remembered something. They remembered someone that was very special in their lives. And as we would stand there, I remember after a few moments, tears would begin to form in my mother's eyes. And we would stand there for a period of time. And then mom would take a bouquet, usually fresh lilacs, off of our tree at home and lay them there before the gravestone. And we would retrace our steps back to the car. And for me as a little kid, it was always somewhat of a relief to get back to the car because I didn't like the way it felt at the gravestone. I just really didn't understand. But as I grew older, I did, because what my parents, my older sister, were remembering were from very special times in their lives, something they missed. They probably thought about the things that could have been, times that could have been enjoyed along the way. Memories that were never able to be made. And to me, that's what Memorial Day was and still is. It's a time to look back and remember those who are special to us, that are no longer with us. As I grew older, you come to learn that Memorial Day wasn't necessarily designed for those such things, but more along the lines of remembering military people who had passed on. Distinguished men and women of courage who had given 
much in their lives that we might experience today as we experience today. Are you grateful for the country we live in today? The freedom we have to come and worship here today? Are you thankful for those along the way who have made it possible? Such a blessing, isn't it? And yet we live in a time in our own country where we should be so thankful for such things that it is getting easier and easier to what? To forget. So much so that even in a lot of our schools, that isn't even part of what history is anymore. And yet it's so much about who we really are. And they are so deserving of being remembered. It was a day that started back in the 1860s, 1868 to be exact. Back then it was called Decoration Day. And it was during the Civil War where Union families brought flowers to gravestones to recognize those soldiers who had given so much in that war. And later it became Memorial Day in recognition of all of those in the military who had given so much that we can experience today as we experience today. And so on this weekend, I would encourage us to remember, to thank God for those that have gone before us. But today as we experience this today, I want to go back several, several centuries before Memorial Day ever was thought of to another group of people who we are indebted to today, especially as Christians. Those who have gone before us as followers of Jesus Christ those that have made it possible for us to be where we are today, knowing and understanding the things that we know today. I want to read you something about those people. By faith, they overthrew kingdoms. They ruled with justice and received what God had promised them. They shut the mouths of lions, quenched the flames of fire, and escaped death by the edge of the sword. Their weakness was turned to strength. They became strong in battle and put whole armies to flight. Women received their loved ones back again from death, but others were tortured, refusing to turn from God in order to be set free. They placed their hope in a better life after the resurrection. Some were jeered at, and their backs were cut open with whips. Others were chained in prison, some died by stoning, and still others were sawed in half. Others killed by the sword. Some went about wearing skins of sheep and goats, destitute and oppressed and mistreated. They were too good for this world, wandering over deserts and mountains, hiding in caves and in holes in the ground. Does words sound familiar? It's the end of Hebrews chapter 11. Talking about distinguished men and women who have gone before us in this journey of faith that we live today. Men and women who we are indebted to because of what they gave. And some gave so much. Some of them are the well-knowns, the Noahs, the Abrahams, the Moseses. And then there's the Jephthahs and the Barracks that we really don't know a whole lot about. But whether they're known or unknown, what they contribute to us today is vital to our existence as script or as Christians. And in that, I wonder today. What do we do to honor them, to remember them? Because you see, there is no memorial day for the heroes of faith in Scripture. 
There is no day that we set aside every year to look back and remember and be thankful for what they have contributed to in our lives here today. And yet I would ask you, where would you be today if it weren't for the Abrahams and the Daniels and the Gideons and the Rahabs, the Davids, the Samsons? Where would we be? And so today, how can we honor a group of people who deserve to be remembered, especially as Christians here today? I would suggest that what follows Hebrews chapter 11 is a recipe of sorts in how we can honor and remember those who have went before us. Hebrews chapter 12 in your Bibles today, if you would turn there with me. I'm just going to look at the first two verses, Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 to 2. If you're following along in the Pew Bible in front of you there, we're on page 1193. Again, that's Hebrews chapter 12 and verses 1 and 2. The very first word of Hebrews chapter 12 is what? Therefore. In biblical terms, that is called a connecting word because it connects us back to what has just been stated. All of the things that were a part of these faithful ones who have went before us. It says, therefore, since we have them, this is what we are to do. Again, we read here, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him, endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. In those two verses, there is one phrase repeated three times, let us. It's an important group of words for us to understand today because it literally means to come alongside or to be near. Now stop and think of some of the Bible heroes we know, the Abrahams, the Moseses, the Joshuas, the Davids, all of those that we can think of. Is it possible for us today physically to come alongside of them? Can I stand next to Abraham today? I can't do it, can I? So what is it the Bible is telling us when it says to come alongside of them or to be near them? Well, it literally means to come alongside of them in their example and in their experience. And again, I would suggest to you today that the absolute best way in which we can honor and remember those who have went before us is to come alongside of them and live in their example and in their experience. And so that's what we are going to do today. The three let us statements we are going to look at more carefully, briefly, in order to be able to, in our own lives, in our own hearts, come alongside of these heroes of faith and therefore honor their memory and what they have meant to us as Christians today. But even beyond that, what we take as encouragement for our lives today in what God would have us to become. So the first one, let us throw off everything that hinders. Now, if you look in the King James, it says that which weighs us down. Throw off everything that hinders or that which weighs us down and the sin that so easily entangles us. When we read that verse, typically the first thing that our minds are drawn to is that word there, sins. The sins that so easily entangle us. Anybody here ever struggle with sins that seem to just 
reach up and grab you at certain times? I think we all have experienced that. How many of you would like to be rid of that? Not experience it anymore. I can't wait for the day when I don't have to be concerned with that anymore. But you know, if we just jump to that and we look at how we get rid of that, we're really missing the most important part of this first statement in coming alongside of them because the first part of it says that we need to throw away that which weighs us down. I will just tell you that spiritually, one way that we struggle as much as we do as Christians is we tend to focus on the sins. We have a problem and we focus on that and sometimes we even go as far as telling God or someone else that we're never going to do that again because we don't like the way it makes us feel after we've done it. And we focus on that so much that we tend to forget that that's not really the problem. The problem lies in a heart that somehow, some way, has a desire for those things. So if we really want to get rid of the actions we don't like, perhaps we should focus on the heart that likes those actions And that's really what Hebrews is telling us. Look back in your Bibles. Keep your finger in Hebrews because we will come right back here. But look in your Bibles with me back to the book of Luke. Luke chapter 21. And we want to look at verse 34, page 1043. Luke chapter 21 and verse 34. Luke 21 and verse 34. It says here, Be careful or your hearts will be what? It says that our hearts will be weighed down. In my Bible it says, With dissipation, drunkenness, and the anxieties of life, and that day will close on you unexpectedly like a what? A trap. So there's really two things that are being talked about here. Something that is weighing down our hearts. And when weighed down, we become very much open to what is below us, which is this trap that is just wanting to get us. Now it says those things that weigh down our hearts, dissipation, drunkenness, and the anxieties of life. Now often we take that word dissipation and we just look at wild living, carousing, partying, drinking, all of those kinds of things. But that's not what the verse says. The word that my Bible defines here as dissipation actually means just living life, eating and drinking, the normal things that every one of us do every single day. Anybody have breakfast this morning? Okay, you fit within the description of what's being said here. Anybody have a drink of water today? If you don't raise your hand, then that's a big no-no because all of you should have had some what already today? Water, okay? Okay. So you've got to be able to raise your hands when you're in here, okay? Because otherwise, I'm going to go home and think, man, what an unhealthy group of people. Because we had five or six people today that have had a glass of water so far. That's not very good. But anyway, we all do those things. Now, drunkenness, that is what it is, and that is part of life in this world. But then the anxieties and the cares of life. Did anybody ex- experience any anxiety in their week this week? A little bit of stress here and there maybe. Again, we only had two, so that's good. That makes up. (laughs) Jeremy keeps raising his hand. (laughs) He's stressed because he's doing closing song today. So, But we all experience those things. And the reality is it's basically telling us that our hearts can be weighed down by just living life in this world and allowing the world to become what? The most important thing in our lives. I want to read something to you here from Matthew Henry's commentary on the New Testament. Speaking of this, it says, it is speaking of all of the inordinate affection and concern for the body and the present life in world in the world that we live in. In other words, all of our concern is about what? Our life here in this world goes on to say then, inordinate care for the present life or fondness for it is a dead weight upon the soul that pulls it down when it should be 
ascending upwards and pulls it back when it should be pressing forward. In other words, when we are so concerned about our life in this world and the things that we want out of this world, it becomes a weight that is holding us down and holding us back. A couple of weeks ago, I was heading into town early on a Sunday morning and just outside of town on the right side of the freeway coming in, there was a big hot air balloon. I think some of you that live here have probably seen it in the morning hours. This is the blue one with the big yellow and red designs on the side of it. And they were just filling up the balloon portion of that, getting ready to take off. Now in this day and age that we live, the hot air balloons are usually tethered to the ground until they have it filled and then they undo that and they will do what? They go up. But I am told, I wasn't there to see, that in old times when they would fill the balloons up, they had bags of sand either strapped to the side of the basket or on the floor of the basket. And when the balloon was filled and they were ready to go up, they would simply take the bags of sand and throw them over or disconnect them from the side of the basket. Getting rid of that weight would allow them to do what? To go up. And what Jesus is telling us here is that the weight of the world is what? It's keeping us down. God would have us to be up here experiencing freedom and joy and peace like we've never experienced it before. And yet we are weighted down because we are so connected to what? To the world in which we live. It has become so important to us sometimes in our lives and and the things that we need and we want and we expect out of this world that we tend to forget that it is weighing our hearts down. And when our hearts are weighed down, Luke tells us we become susceptible to what that is around us. There is a trap, isn't there? The devil knows that this world is a trap. Hebrews talks about it weighing down and then getting rid of the sin that so easily entangles us. Imagine that down here, this life in this world is just this tangled mess of vines going everywhere and it is so easy to get caught up and trip around in that and stumble and fall and yet God is saying, let your heart be mine. Give up the cares and the anxieties of this world and live for me and I will do what? I will lift you above that which is entangling you. You want to know an easy way to escape sin that you're struggling with in your life, it is to give your heart fully to who? A heart fully committed to Jesus will be a heart that can overcome sin. It is looking to Jesus instead of looking to the what? To the sin. Memorial Day is a time for many to go out and camp. It is a time for many to go out and camp and get wet because it's Memorial Day and evidently the clouds know we're camping and so it rains, right? A camping trip, not on Memorial Day, but towards the end of the summer with some friends when we lived in Missoula, um, we experienced something that you experience towards the end of summer sometimes except it was like multiplied by a hundred times, and that were wasp and hornets that were just all over the place. It was making camping very miserable because if you tried to eat or do anything, there were just hundreds of them swarming around you. You couldn't even hardly do anything at all. And the friend we were camping with had heard of a bee trap or a hornet trap, and it was simply this, tying a piece of food on the end of a string and then dangling that over a bowl of water that was filled with dish soap. You would put the food about a half inch to an inch above the soapy water. So we did that, and we took it away from camp and and put the food on the end of the string, had the soapy water under there, and we noticed something very interesting. All the bees started coming to this food. The wasp and the hornets were there, and they would get on that, and they would begin to eat, and they would eat and eat and eat, And they would eat so much that when they went to fly away, they were heavier than they had anticipated, heavier than when they got there. And so instead of just going straight away, 
they always went down before they could come back up. And in going down, they got soapy water on themselves and just miraculously didn't get anywhere. We went back to that little trap about a half hour after we had set it up, and you could not see the surface of the water anymore. There were literally hundreds and hundreds of wasps and bees. Now the problem was, is they had gotten weighed down, and they became susceptible to the trap that was set beneath them. Hebrews chapter 12 is telling us that in order to come alongside and experience the faith of those who have gone before us, we must put aside those things in our hearts that are weighing us down so that we may escape the sin that so easily entangles us. Lay aside today the weight of the world. And let Jesus lift you up above all that is below us and so easily entangles us. Number two, let us run with perseverance the race that is marked out before us. Run with perseverance the race that is marked out before us. Did you know that God has a path and a way laid out for each one of us today that leads to the place where he wants us to go? For every one of us today, there is a way that is prepared for us. In your Bibles, turn to Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 16. Hebrews, or not Hebrews, Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 16. You go to Hebrews chapter 6, you are going to be very confused when I start reading here. Jeremiah chapter 6 and verse 16, page 754. There's a good reason that my mind was distracted. I'm thinking of another thing here that I forgot to do. And, and Dick, if you don't mind helping me out just a little bit, I think we have just a regular sweeping broom in this back closet. If you wouldn't mind bringing that up to the front here and just throw it on the pew. I'm going to need it later. I was thinking about that and thinking about preaching at the same time, and obviously you just found out I can't do what? Two things at once, okay? It's a big problem for me. So anyway, Jeremiah chapter 6 and verse 16, back now to this path that Jesus has laid before us. I love this verse of all the verses that we find in the Old Testament because it kind of gives us an idea of what we're reading about here in Hebrews, but something that should be very important in our lives. This is what the Lord says. So who's speaking here? God speaking. So when we read that in the Bible, should that be something that gets our attention? God is speaking. And he's telling us here, stand at the crossroads and look and ask for what? The ancient paths. Ask where the good way is, and do what? And walk in it. Imagine yourselves in this verse, we've come to a crossroads, a fork in the road, and we don't know which way to go. What is Jeremiah, what is the Lord through Jeremiah encouraging us to do? To look to God for which path? The right path. Because are there paths that go to the wrong places in life today? Yes. If I were to show you the Montana map, how to get to Wetsby, it's kind of like a spider web from Bozeman. You could get there a million different ways because there's a million different dirt roads out there that might get there. But there's probably one best way. And what God is saying, there is one best way that I have marked out before you. This is where I want you to run the race. So when you come to these places in your life, he, he's telling us to consider and look for the ancient paths. What does that mean, the ancient paths? Those are the ones that people before us have what? They have gone on. They have found them to be the path that goes to the right place. It's the good path, and we are encouraged to walk in it. It goes on to say, if we do this, we will find rest for our souls. And here's the real sad part of this verse. 
because it goes on to say, but you said we will not do what? We will not walk in it. Therein lies Israel's problem, okay? So we don't want to, <laughs> excuse me, really be following after Israel, but rather those who have found that ancient path, the good path, and they have found that rest for their souls. You ever taken a wrong turn before at a crossroads? I remember when we were living up in Haver, I had to come down to a meeting here in Bozeman, and we had done that numerous times. And so to break up the monotony of driving from Haver to Bozeman, which is a, a long drive, and certain parts of it are just a long straight road, um, we would sometimes go through Great Falls, and instead of continuing on the freeway to Helena and around, we would go over Kings Hill and down through White Sulphur, Clyde Park, and just east of Livingston there. And I had chosen to do that that morning. I'd gotten up early, and it was shortly after the sun had come up, and I was driving. And when you get through White Sulphur and are headed south, there is a fork in the road. One road leads to Townsend, which is not where I wanted to go. The other road leads to the freeway just east of Livingston. I have no idea what I was doing but I was evidently a little bit more than brain dead at the moment because I was driving along, and to this day, I have no idea when, how it happened. I don't even remember the intersection. All I remember is that sometime later, I came to what was left of my senses, if there was any to begin with, and I recognized I was driving in a very narrow canyon with this creek on one side, steep banks going up both sides, and all the trees had been burned by a forest fire. And I said, you know what? I have no idea where I am. I know where I should be because if I'm going down through Clyde Park to east of Livingston, it's nothing but big, flat, grassy fields with rolling hills that I like to look for elk and deer and antelope as I'm driving. I was not there. I had absolutely no idea where I was. It was kind of just one of those brief, scary moments for a minute, like, how in the world did I get here? Am I on another planet right now kind of a thing? And then I had a decision to make. How long have I been driving on this road that is the wrong road? Should I go back? Or should I continue forward? Somebody else is trying to preach today. You study your lesson to week this week? I'm going to be like James and John. Lord, should I cast thunder and lightning down upon them? No. <laughs> Jesus says no. If he's preaching the gospel, he is for us. Sounded like the guy that reads during Bible study. But anyway, I decided, you know what? I'm just going to continue on and see where I end up. And a few moments later, I ran into a sign that said Townsend like 12 miles. Then I realized a couple of things. A, I knew where I was. I knew I could get to Bozeman from Townsend. But I also realized that I was going to be a little bit late for my meeting because I had went a little bit off course. It's important, isn't it, to recognize and realize the paths that we are taking. It is so easy in this life that we're living to take the wrong path and we wind up in a place where we have no idea where we are. And seriously, for us today, Jesus is saying, stop and look for the ancient path, the one that those before you have walked on, the one that leads to the place I would have you to go. Take those paths, walk in it, and you will find it to be a good thing. It will bring rest for your souls. It says that we are to run the race with perseverance or endurance. The word perseverance or endurance there simply means if you start, don't stop. Adam Clark's commentary puts it this way, let us start, run on, and continue running until we get to the goal. The year was 1983. In Australia, it is called an ultra-marathon, 540 miles from Sydney to Melbourne. Athletes run this race. That's right, we said run this race. It typically takes between five and six days for these well-trained athletes to go 540 miles. 
My feeble mind can do the math. That comes to over 100 miles a day. That's scary to me, running 100 miles a day. Race day comes, and all of the athletes are there. They're in their Nike and Adidas and all whatever sports companies they represent, the perfect shoes, the perfect shorts and tops, all of those things. They look like they belong there, but Cliff Young, 61 years old, walks in amongst the athletes. He's wearing coveralls and work boots. Everybody thinks he is just a misplaced spectator. But Cliff Young is there to run the race. He goes to the table and he soon has a race number on the front of his coveralls. And the time for the race starts and nobody can believe that this is happening. This 61-year-old man in coveralls and work boots is right there with all of these finely trained and tuned athletes in all of their proper gear and the gun goes off and away they go. And the story gets funnier for those walk, watching at that point because as the trained athletes go off running, Cliff is just simply kind of shuffling along at a fast pace. People laugh at first, but then they begin to become concerned. Is this 61-year-old really know what he's doing? Maybe he's lost his mind. This probably isn't going to be very safe for him. After day one... Cliff Young is quite a ways behind the pack, as you can imagine. Now, the normal course of running this race is to run for 18 of the 24 hours in a day, and you rest for the other six. And so that is what the trained athletes did. Day one, again, he was quite a ways behind. But day two, people who were really paying attention began to notice something. Cliff Young was actually making up ground on all of these athletes. And day three, he was a little closer. And by day four to day five, something that they would have never, ever imagined had taken place because Cliff Young had caught up with the front of the pack. And the most amazing thing, Cliff Young won the race in a record time, some 10 hours ahead of his nearest competitor. 61 years old, coveralls and work boots. His secret? Oh, you see, those finely tuned athletes ran 18 hours and slept for six. Cliff never ever once stopped. Five plus days, he went non-stop. He ran with endurance and perseverance. God is asking us to run the race marked out before us with what? Perseverance and endurance. He is telling us not to what? Don't stop. Because when we stop, we allow the things of the world to weigh us down. When we stop, we no longer are moving forward, but we become tangled up in the things around us. God's encouragement is to find the path that those before us have walked and walk in it and do so with endurance and perseverance, not stopping, but pressing forward until we reach the prize. The third let us statement, let us fix our eyes upon Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Fix our eyes upon who? Upon Jesus. Can anybody look up and see Jesus today? I think I could probably say in a sense that I can, but in a physical sense, it becomes very hard for us to understand what it means to fix our eyes upon Jesus. Now I would have you go back to Hebrews, this time Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 1. 
because the author of Hebrews is going to help us out just a little bit here. Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 1. Page 1185, if you have misplaced Hebrews there. Hebrews 3, verse 1, Therefore, holy brothers, who share in the heavenly calling. What is our calling? We have a heavenly calling, don't we? This race that Jesus has marked out before us leads to where? Leads to our heavenly calling, the place where we will be with God for eternity. It says, Therefore, holy brothers, who share in the heavenly calling, fix your what? Fix your thoughts upon Jesus. Isn't that an interesting way of putting it? When we are looking to Jesus, fixing our eyes upon Jesus, the real message that we are receiving here is that we are to meditate and to think upon Jesus. I want to read something from Selected Messages, Volume 3 here. It says, To study Christ and study His character feature by feature. Stop and think about that. What is to be our study? Jesus and his character, and we are to do it feature by feature. In other words, that isn't a wake up in the morning and read through three chapters of the Bible very quickly so we can check off Bible study for the day and then move forward. We are actually studying with an intent, and our intent is to find out about whose character, the character of Jesus. Every detail says he is our pattern that we are required to copy in our lives and in our characters, else we fail to represent Jesus. I present before you the man Christ Jesus, and listen to this, you must individually know him as your Savior before you can study him as the pattern for your example. I dare say that there have been far too many times in my life and in the lives of Christians where we have studied Jesus to try to be like him, but we have forgotten one very critical thing, and that is our relationship with Jesus. You know, I hear often the relationship, relationship, that's all we talk about. What does that mean? Well, let me tell you, your relationship with Jesus means everything. If you don't have it, you will never, ever be like him. We don't study this book so we can tell somebody how much we know. We study this book so we will know who is in this book. We study this book not so we can be Seventh-day Adventist. We study this book so we can know Jesus Christ as our Savior. And when that happens, when we are in a relationship with Jesus and we know Jesus, we can see every single feature of his character. And as we meditate upon those, as we behold them, we become changed and we become like who? Like Jesus. Thank you, Dick, for bringing this forward. Apologies to those who have seen this before, because some have. Kids at the elementary school, and if you've been at the Schumacher's house for Bible study, this was demonstrated by Lee Venden there. But, simple broom and a simple task, seemingly. Try to balance, and you can go home and try this, balance the broom on the palm of your hand. First way to try it, okay, is that you have to focus only on one place and one place only where the broom hits the palm of your hand. That's the only place you can look is right there. And if I try to do that, as hard as I try, it's going to fall away. I can't do it and I won't take any more time trying. But now I'm going to show you something different. And to make it even more difficult, I'm just going to use two fingers and not the big palm of my hand. Two fingers. And now instead of looking down at my fingers, I'm going to look where? I'm going to look up. I'm going to fix my eyes on where they're supposed to be. And it becomes something that is very easy even for someone like me. The point of all of that is not that I can balance a broom on my fingers because that doesn't do a whole lot of good for any of us. But the point of it is, if we fix our eyes where they belong, where does our life come into? comes into balance, doesn't it? Because our eyes are on who? 
Jesus. We live in a world that is running to and fro, in a world that is very much out of balance. And God is telling us, find the right path, persevere and go forward, keeping your eyes, meditating on, having a relationship with who? With Jesus Christ. And in that way, we are walking alongside of those who have went before us. The author and the finisher of our faith. An interesting thing here, the word hour is not in the original manuscripts. The original manuscripts simply say, the author and the finisher of faith, period. No hour there. It has been added in all of our translations that we have. What this tells us is not that Jesus isn't the author and the finisher of my faith, because he certainly is. But what it tells us is Jesus is the author and the finisher of all faith. There is no way to have it outside of who? Outside of Jesus. And there is no way to have faith become complete in your life outside of Jesus. That is the only way. And just as he was the author and the finisher of the faith of Abraham, of Moses, of all of those listed in Hebrews chapter 11, he will be the same for us today. He is the one who helps us to understand what faith is, what grace is, what mercy is. All of those things are gifts from Jesus Christ, and he gives them to us. And he works in our lives to build that faith. And one day, he is going to do what? He is going to perfect or finish that faith. And in all of these things, we are encouraged. Therefore, since we are surrounded by this group of faithful witnesses, here is the way to live your life. Come alongside of them. Be lifted up in Jesus with them. Walk in the path that they walked. Fix your eyes on the very same Jesus that they fixed their eyes upon. One last verse here, Hebrews chapter 11. Hopefully you're still in that area. Hebrews 11, verses 39 and 40. Speaking of those heroes of faith in Hebrews chapter 11, notice what it says. These were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised. What was the promise that they didn't yet receive? It's the prize that is before us, isn't it? And listen to what it says here. God, verse 40, had planned something better for who? For us, so that only together with us, they would be made perfect. They would be finished. You see God's plan? At the end of the day, it's not just about them back then, not just about us today, but God's plan is that everyone would come to this place together, that we would come alongside one another, that we would be side by side in our faith, in our eyes turned to Jesus, walking on the path that he has set before us. What better way can we honor those who have went before us than by living the life that God lived in them and desires to live in us, that one day we all might be perfected in our walk with God. And very quickly, one other thing. We are waiting each and every day for who to return? Jesus to return. Did you wake up today and hope that Jesus might come? You know, sometimes we forget, don't we? I don't think God wants us to forget. I think God wants us to live every day as if Jesus is coming. But you know what? Jesus has tarried, hasn't he? These men and women of old, many believe they would see the price in their day. And yet it says... None of them received what had been promised. But look at what we see in them today. Are they examples that we want to come alongside? Are they examples that have blazed a trail before us and endured and persevered? They are. 
What about our lives? If the Lord should tarry past our generation, how will we be viewed? There is a song that is going to be our closing song today. And I'm just going to read you the chorus. It's going to be a young 16-year-old girl on the screen momentarily who will sing it for us. But it was written by Steve Green. And it is entitled, Find Us Faithful. Again, I just want you to hear the words of the chorus and understand what we're talking about here today. Oh, may all who come behind us find us faithful. May the fire of our devotion light their way. May the footprints that we leave lead them to believe. And the lives we live inspire them to obey. Oh, may all who come behind us find us faithful. You know, we look to the heroes of faith from Scripture. Somehow, some way, that was God's song that He impressed upon their hearts. As we look back to them, as we look to them today, we find them to be faithful, don't we? My prayer for us as we close today that in honoring them, we will come alongside them. And if the Lord should tarry, that those who come behind us would also find us to be faithful.